Good evening. I'm Dr. Andrew LaBarbera, Chief Scientific Officer of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the 13th presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These twice monthly webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Tonight's presentation is by Dr. Stacy E. Pollack. Dr. Pollack resides at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where she is Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women and Director of Undergraduate Medical Education. The title of Dr. Pollack's talk this evening is Amenorrhea and Other Menstrual Cycle Disorders. I'll now turn the microphone over to Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, our education specialist, who will review the details of today's presentation and introduce Dr. Pollack. Thank you so much. Hello to everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, the ASRM Education Specialist and Moderator for this webinar. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, to make sure we can cover all of the content in the allotted time, everyone's line except the speakers will be muted. We will devote time at the end of the presentation to questions. Please feel free to type a question in the chat window at any time during the presentation. We will then read as many selected questions as possible to the presenter. If for some reason you need to step away from the presentation, please sign out and then sign back in upon your return. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your CME credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Stacy Pollack. We're very excited for her, and I will now hand things over to Dr. Pollack. Thank you all so much. I'm excited to be able to give this talk to you all tonight. I have nothing to disclose. And my learning objectives for today are that at the conclusion of this presentation, I expect all the participants should be able to describe what constitutes a menstrual cycle disorder to define oligomenorrhea, primary and secondary amenorrhea, and ovarian failure and ovarian insufficiency, to be able to determine in a systemic way the possible cause for a menstrual cycle disorder, and to be able to classify menstrual cycle disorders according to accepted paradigms such as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. So first let's define what's normal. Normal cycle intervals are between 21 and 35 days in length and in truth for women that are between 25 and 35 years of age at least 60 percent of cycles fall within 25 and 28 days. And we know a lot of this from a classic study by Trey Lawar back in 1967. On the x-axis, one can see age, and on the y-axis, one can see the mean interval in days between menstrual cycle onsets. If you look at the center portion of the graph, you can see a very tight range for the length of menstrual cycles for the majority of reproductive years. And it's only when you get to the extremes at the left and the right, the left being the years immediately following menarche, and the right being the years leading up to the menopause, that there's greater variability in menstrual cycle length. Days of bleeding range from two to seven. In Menarche, the median age in the United States is 12.8 years. Now let's define the players. The hypothalamus is the pulse generator. And according to a colleague and mentor of mine, she refers to the hypothalamus as the Don. Very bossy and likes to control lots of things. When it comes to the menstrual cycle, the main hormone involved is GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone although of course not the only hormone involved. Next up is the pituitary. And if you think of the hypothalamus as the don, the pituitary is like the consigliere. Also pretty bossy, likes to control lots of things, and doesn't take orders from too many places other than the hypothalamus. Also many pituitary hormones involved in menstrual cycle regularity, but the main players are FSH and LH. Next is the ovary, and the ovary produces many things, steroid hormones such as estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone, peptide hormones such as inhibin, and gametes. Then there's the uterus and the endometrium, and next is the outflow tract, including the vagina and the hymen. I'm a visual learner, so let's put this together graphically. 
The hypothalamus releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH, in little pulses. These pulses are short for a very short half-life hormone, which is GnRH. It travels a very short distance in a closed circuit to get to the pituitary, where it can release one of two gonadotropins, FSH or LH. And it's this change in pulse frequency and amplitude that allows one hormone, GnRH, to tell the pituitary to release one of two main hormones. So GnRH goes to the pituitary and tells it to release FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone. This FSH, in turn, travels to the ovary and tells the ovary to grow the follicles where the oocytes reside and to make estradiol. The FSH goes to those follicles and causes granulosa cell mitosis. It upregulates FSH receptors. It upregulates LH receptors because it knows what's coming next. And it recruits stroma to become fecal cells. In addition, FSH increases aromatase, which takes the androgens that are made in the theca cells and converts them to estrogens in the granulosa cells. And testosterone gets converted to estradiol. In addition, FSH also makes those granulosa cells make inhibin. And together, this estradiol and this inhibin feed back to the hypothalamic pituitary axis and tell the hypothalamus to stop, stop making FSH. Because unlike cats and dogs and mice, which make many follicles and ovulate many eggs, humans are single ovulating species, typically. But the follicle continues to grow, and estradiol continues to rise, and now there needs to be a signal that tells the ovary it's time to get the egg out. And once estradiol is high enough, for a long enough period of time, roughly 200 picogram per ml for 51, 52 hours, Instead of having negative feedback on the hypothalamic pituitary axis, it elicits positive feedback, and it changes GnRH to be, fast, uh, to be faster pulses, which favor LH release over FSH. So one can think of low estradiol levels as it inhibiting GnRH pulsatility and decreasing FSH, whereas high estradiol levels that are sustained lead to a positive feedback. This then leads to the release of LH from the pituitary, which goes to the ovary and causes ovulation. It upregulates uh, proteolytic enzymes and prostaglandins. In addition, it progresses that oocyte through meiosis from prophase one, dictate in prophase one, where the oocytes have been arrested since around 20 weeks gestation, to progress through metaphase two. The LH also luteinizes the granulosa and the fecal cells so that they're able to form progesterone. And now this LH leads to the corpus luteum and the release of progesterone. And estradiol and progesterone don't only feed back to the hypothalamic pituitary axis, but it also goes to the uterus. And another mentor of mine referred to the uterine lining, the endometrium, as a building. And she thought of estradiol as supplying the bricks, making that lining nice and thick and robust and causing mitoses of the endometrial glands, and the, and the progesterone as mortar, stabilizing that lining, preventing it from overgrowing itself into a cancer or a precancer, and creating the implantation window, allowing for implantation of an embryo. Because really the whole purpose of the menstrual cycle is to allow for people to remain on the planet. If someone is pregnant, the trophoblast makes HCG, which binds to the LH receptor, and maintains that corpus luteum so it can continue producing estradiol and progesterone until the placenta takes over. And with that estradiol and progesterone, the pregnant uterus does not bleed. If one is not pregnant, however, the corpus luteum only lives for about 10, 12 days, then it involutes, estrogen and progesterone levels fall, and it's like the TNT squad came and blew up the building, and the endometrial lining sheds, and someone bleeds as long as they have a uterus, a functioning endometrium, and a patent outflow track. But it's not only GnRH making FSH, leading to estradiol, building the lining like bricks, and then LH leading to progesterone, stabilizing the lining like mortar, and then withdrawing it and bleeding. There are many other hormones that are under hypothalamic pituitary regulation that also play roles in the menstrual cycle. One notable one is prolactin, which is released from the pituitary. 
And the main influence for prolactin from the hypothalamus is dopamine. And dopamine is inhibitory to prolactin release. If one cut off dopamine and didn't allow dopamine to get to the pituitary, prolactin levels would rise. Prolactin feeds back to the hypothalamic pituitary axis and diminishes GnRH pulsatility, and this might be through endogenous opioids. Now, if endogenous opioids can inhibit GnRH pulsatility, so can exogenous opioids. And so women that are on opioids, such as methadone addicts, can have a lack of menstrual cycles or irregular menstrual cycles due to the alteration in their GnRH positivity. Making matters even more confusing is that dopamine also itself can inhibit GnRH positivity. Next up is cortisol. And cortisol is that stress hormone. It allows us to mobilize sugars, so in times of stress, we can mobilize all our energy to escape from whatever horrible thing is about to happen. I like to think of it as if I were in a jungle running away from a tiger, I would increase my cortisol so I could run away from that tiger, right? I need sugar to be able to run away. And the super physiologic levels of cortisol can inhibit GnRH pulsatility, but nothing that's actually sustainable or attainable in a human. The main signal from the pituitary releasing cortisol is ACTH. And the main signal from the hypothalamus releasing ACTH is CRH. Now, CRH itself can inhibit GnRH pulsatility. But when ACTH is being made, it's first made from a larger compound known as POM-C, pro-opio-melanocortin. And this gets cleaved into things such as MSH, uh, which is accountable for why women with Addison's disease have hyperpigmentation, particularly on their extensor surfaces but also endorphins. POMC gets cleaved into endorphins, and it's these endorphins that might be one of the main reasons why women under times of stress have an inhibition of GnRH positivity and a lack of the menstrual cycle. Now, I will say it's not completely clear how stress causes a change in menstrual cycle regularity and can lead to amenorrhea, but we do know that the more stressors one has, the more likely one is to have amenorrhea. And we also know that there are also roles played by the energy balance how much energy we're intaking versus how much energy we're expending. And this particularly comes up in women with eating disorders and exercise, which often go hand in hand with one another. Another important hormone is TRH. And TRH goes to the pituitary and makes TSH. And TSH goes to the thyroid gland and makes thyroid hormone, T3 and T4. And thyroid hormone is mostly important for controlling metabolism. And certainly, it controls metabolism of all of these hormones that affect the menstrual cycle. So any kind of thyroid abnormality can lead to a menstrual cycle irregularity for reasons that are not completely clear. But if one has primary hypothyroidism, meaning that the thyroid gland itself is incapable of making thyroid hormone, the body compensates by making higher TSH and higher TRH. And this TRH actually stimulates prolactin release and this elevated prolactin can also feed back to the hypothalamic pituitary axis to shut off GnRH pulsatility. Let's just define some more terms. Oligomenorrhea is when you have menstrual cycle intervals that are greater than 35 days or less than nine menses a year. Polymenorrhea, not an often used term, is when the interval is more frequent than every 21 days. Menorrhagia is heavy menstrual flow, even though there's a normal interval. And metrorrhagia is irregular intervals or bleeding between menses. And another colleague of mine once told me to think of the menstrual cycle, to think of the periods as the stations for a train. And if you bleed between stations, you have metrorrhagia. Amenorrhea is no period. And this could be either primary and secondary. Primary basically means you've never had a period, and secondary means you once had one and now you don't, either for three cycle lengths or for three to six months. Primary can be defined as either having secondary or not having secondary sex characteristics. And the main secondary sex characteristics we're thinking about are breast development, because breasts are bioassay for estrogen. And if a girl has breast development, we know that she's been exposed to estrogen, most likely from her ovaries. So we believe that there has been some kind of activation of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And therefore, we usually give these girls until age 15 before we begin to start to think about initiating a workup. 
If a girl does not have any secondary sex characteristics, then we worry something bigger may be going on, and we initiate that workup at an earlier age, at 13. In addition, if a girl has the onset of breast development, but no period within somewhere between three and five years, and there's still no period, then we still initiate a workup. Ovarian failure. You can think of this as the absence of both ovulation, absence of eggs, and the absence of the ability to make hormones. Age-related ovarian failure is the menopause. Right? There's really a loss of eggs at this age, essentially. Um, of course, the menopausal ovary is not completely hormonally inactive, um, but certainly estradiol is much, much lower. And the median age of menopause has remained pretty constant at 51.3 years over the past centuries. Premature ovarian failure is when there's ovarian failure at less than 40 years of age, which affects about 1% of women. But really, POF is not a fair term. And the better term to use is POI, primary ovarian insufficiency. And this reflects the fact that unlike age-related ovarian failure, or age-appropriate ovarian failure, women with POI do have some eggs left in their ovary. And indeed, about 10% of them will ovulate and get pregnant, although this is not predictable. FIGO and ACOG have a new classification for thinking about AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding, not to use the term DUB, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And this AUB can cl be classified as either heavy or intermenstrual. And there's this acronym, POM COIN, which talks about structural and then non-structural causes of irregular uterine bleeding. So when I think of menstrual cycle disorders and amenorrhea, I kind of put them together utilizing two paradigms. I think about compartments, whether or not there's a problem happening in the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the ovary, the uterus, or the remainder of the outflow tract. But I also think about the WHO classifications. Class 1, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, meaning low FSH, low estrogen. Class 2, normogonadotropic, normoestrogenic, normal FSH levels with normal estrogen, but normal in this category means normal for early follicular phase. And so one should always remember that FSH can look low. So low and normal can often look the same. Class 3 is hypergonadotropic, hypogonadism. Hypergonadotropic meaning high FSH, hypogonadism meaning low estrogen. And you may note that between class 1, 2, and 3, FSH is getting progressively higher. Class 4 is hyperprolactinemia. But I'll tell you that although the WHO likes to think of class 4, I usually think that, that hyperprolactinemia can actually either fit in to class 1 or class 2. If the prolactin has shut down the hypothalamic pituitary axis completely, one gets hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And if it's only shut off the hypothalamic pituitary axis partially, such that there's irregular signals with some FSH to allow for some estradiol production, but never enough FSH to allow for a full follicular development or enough estradiol to lead to an LH surge and ovulation. So you don't get any progesterone. You get estrogen without progesterone. And these irregular cycles can lead to any kind of menstrual pattern. But I like to think of things in cases. So let's go through our first case. This is a 21-year-old girl with no menses. She has no real illnesses, denies any extreme exercise or drug use. She's 5'8 and 130 pounds with a BMI of 19.8. You notice very little axillary hair, and she has no breast development but normal pubic hair development. If you did a pelvic, you'd find a small uterus and normal gonads. If you got some tests, you'd find that her thyroid function tests were normal, her prolactin level was normal, her FSH and LH were in the low range, and her estradiol was also low. And if you check the androgens, although I'm not saying that you should, you would find that they would be normal. Imaging by either ultrasound or MRI would reveal a normal but pre-pubertally sized uterus and normal ovaries, but you wouldn't really notice a ton of antral follicles. This is another study that looks at plasma FSH levels in the x-axis and percent samples. The black are, sa are samples that have, or ovaries, that have follicles and eggs. And the white are, are ovaries that do not have any follicles or eggs. Now, this is an older FSH lab assay, so don't look at the absolute numbers, but just look at the trend. When you have lower FSH levels, 
you're more likely to have eggs. When you have higher FSH levels, you're less likely to have eggs. So this is a case of hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is really a special case of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which can have many causes. This is where our eating disorders fall into, any chronic illness or stress. Of course, there can be constitutional delay. Just a family's trend is to go through puberty later. Hyperprolactinemia and hypothyroidism can fit in here. Drug abuse with opioids, which can shut down the hypothalamic pituitary access. Medications such as antipsychotics, which uh, often can affect dopamine. And intracranial lesions, such as a craniopharyngioma. And this is something that one should always think about. There can be intracranial lesions that are affecting the hypothalamic pituitary axis, even things like hydrocephalus. So one always wants to rule that out before one says that she's not getting her period because of stress. Overall, the etiology is too few or potentially no GnRH pulses. The extreme example is Kalman syndrome. Uh, this is a congenital condition whereby the GnRH neurons didn't make it to the hypothalamus. It can often be associated with anosmia or hypoosmia because the olfactory neurons migrate with the GnRH neurons to get to the hypothalamus. There are numerous genes that are involved in this. Some cases are X-linked, some cases are dominant, some cases are recessive, but one that we often think of is an X-linked form, form caused by a gene called Cal1 found on the short arm of the X chromosome, which encodes a protein called anosmin-1, which is a neuromigratory protein responsible for the migration of the GnRH and olfactory neurons. Treatment is providing estrogen and progesterone to either allow for breast development or to maintain it, to stop growth of the long bones by closing the epiphyses, and to optimize and maintain bone density. We want to also increase the uterine size. In addition, the estrogen and progesterone will stimulate the endometrium and allow for menses. If this person wants to get pregnant, one could use a GnRH pump, if that was available in the United States, or one could use exogenous FSH and LH. It's important to remember that if they have a hypothalamic pituitary access that is not working, treatments with medications that rely on a functional hypothalamic pituitary access should not work. So in a patient with class 1 disorder, medications like clomiphene citrate or letrozole should not work to induce ovulation. It's also important to stress that we need to optimize these patients' weight to make sure that their pregnancies will be healthy. Uh, certainly, some risks are low birth weight and preterm birth. In addition, if we don't optimize these patients' weight, they're at risk for long-term complications in themselves for osteoporosis. This is a basal body temperature for a patient that was on a GnRH pump. And we can see here that the GnRH pump will allow for increasing estradiol levels as the follicle gets larger, temperature is low, and then once ovulation occurs, that's evidenced by progesterone rising, there's a sustained rise in the basal body temperature of about 6 degrees, excuse me, 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit that should last for anywhere between 12, 10 and 12 days to indicate ovulation has occurred. This is another case of a class 1 disorder. You can see this woman is quite thin. She has temporal wasting, lots of bony prominences sticking out. And this is a woman that has an eating disorder. It could be anorexia, it could be bulimia, it could be mixed disorders, and it's often associated with exercise issues. This is an old-fashioned fish graph, which we don't use anymore, that looks at height and weight to get a, a present of ideal body weight. And according to Frisch, he had a critical weight hypothesis that said one needed about 22% body fat for sustaining menses and 12% body fat to initiate menarche. We now know, and remember this was in 85, we now know that this is probably related to adipokines such as leptin, because we know that as girls go through puberty, they get fatter, they get more fat, leptin rises, and one needs leptin to turn on GnRH positivity. So the summary of the key points here is that with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, we have low or normal gonadotropins, or normal looking, let's put that in quotes, low estrogen, typically normal karyotype, 46XX. There's a diminution or an absence of GnRH pulses, and this can often be associated with stress, eating disorders, and extreme exercise. 
but it's important to remember that the ovary still functions, that these girls still have eggs, and they still have the capability of making hormones. And they are fertile. Next case. This is an 18-year-old girl with no periods. She's short at 4 feet 7 inches with a BMI of almost 23. She has some axillary hair, but she really doesn't have any breast development and very little pubic hair. If you did a pelvic exam, you'd find a small uterus and you would not be able to palpate her gonads. You would also notice things such as a webbed neck, a low hairline, a high arched palate, cubitus valgus, which is an increased carrying angle of the arm, a shield chest, and a short fourth metacarpal, which you could notice if you asked her to make a fist. Here you could notice the shield chest and, of course, the webbing of the neck. You would also notice that she's rather short. If you check labs, you'd find that her gonadotropins, FSH and LH, are both elevated and her estradiol is low. And if you checked androgens, which once again I'm not saying you should, you would find that they would be normal. Imaging would reveal a normal, although prepubertally sized uterus, and no gonads were visible. Again, reminding you that the higher the FSH, the more likely you are to have no eggs. And this is a case of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, sometimes also called ovarian failure, POI. Again, that's primary ovarian insufficiency. And this can be primary or secondary, meaning that you lose your period or maybe you never had a period and never even went through puberty. Again, etiologies can be many, but here we want to always think about some genetic causes, such as Turner syndrome being 45X, or various 46XY causes, including mutations of the WT1 gene. Here we also think about fragile X premutation, or even repeats in the intermediate zone that can be associated with POI. Also, we have here girls that have received chemotherapy or radiation, sickle cell, various enzymatic defects, as well as infection with things such as mumps. You can obtain a karyotype when the patient has a high FSH, and here you find a single X chromosome. 45X, and this is Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is associated with many other abnormalities. About 33% of patients with Turner syndrome will have cardiovascular anomalies, such as a bicuspid, a or a bicuspid aortic valve, co-optation of the aorta, and aortic aneurysms. In addition, they can have baryaneurysms in their head because it's the same defect of the intima of the blood vessels. They can have associated renal anomalies, hearing loss, diabetes, a variety of autoimmune disorders, including about 10% of Turner patients having hypothyroidism. So when one has a patient with Turner syndrome, one certainly wants to screen for these things. Treatment would be providing estrogen and progestin to maintain or develop the breasts, to maintain and maximize bone density, to increase the uterine size, to stimulate the endometrium, and to allow for menstrual flow. If the patient has a Y chromosome, one needs to remove those gonads because of the risk of malignant transformation into germ cell tumors. This is particularly true if a person has a mutation of WT1 where it's associated uh, uh, germ cell tumors occur about 30% of the time in this particular patient population. With regards to fertility, often patients with POI, we can offer, if we can find it when it's still impending, there's maybe the potential for fertility preservation. Egg donation and adoption, of course. Remembering that about 10% of patients with POI will ovulate, but it's sporadic, unpredictable, and typically not with genetic causes. In addition, when one has a patient with Turner syndrome, one really needs to have a much longer and larger conversation with the patient, because the safety of that person getting pregnant really depends on many, many factors not the least of which is the size of her aortic root. So the summary of the key points here is that patients with hypergonadotropic hypogonadism have high gonadotropins, low estrogen. It's often associated with an abnormal karyotype such as 45X. And here you have an ovarian failure. You can think of it as being no more eggs and a, really a decrease in hormone production. Let's move on to our third case. This is a 25-year-old girl with irregular menses and excessive hair growth. She doesn't report any significant medical problems. She had her first period at age 11 with a concurrent onset of abdominal and facial hair. 
She gets her period every two to four months, the last time which was four months ago. And she has a family history significant for a father with diabetes and a mother with hirsutism. On physical exam, she's 5'6 and 188 pounds, putting her in a BMI in the obese category. On physical exam, you notice hair on her upper lip, chin, cheeks, neck, chest. She also has hair on her lower back, her thighs, her buttocks, and a, an escutcheon tracking towards her umbilicus. If you did a pelvic exam, you would find a normal uterus and normal ovaries. You check labs, and here androgens certainly are indicated, and you would find that any androgen you check could potentially be increased, an elevated testosterone, an elevated androstenedione, an elevated DHEAS, and potentially a slightly elevated 17-hydroxyprogesterone. A 17-hydroxyprogesterone is not an androgen, it's a pre-androgen, right? it's the immediate precursor, um, but one can certainly find that elevated, and certainly one wants to screen for this when looking for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, particularly late onset, when we're thinking about 21-hydroxylase deficiency. If one checked FSH and LH, they would be normal, but you might find a slightly altered ratio where LH is relatively higher to FSH in a greater way than typical, and you would find that her progesterone level would not be in the ovulatory zone. Right? If you saw a progesterone of 3 nanogram per milliliter, that indicates ovulation, but here you would find it to be low, and if you did a basal body temperature chart, you would find that it's monophasic, indicating that the patient was not ovulating. Here you can see various symptoms on the x-axis and testosterone production rate. And you can see the greater the testosterone production rate, the more significant the symptoms. So with modest levels of, product, of testosterone, you can have increased body and facial hair. Slightly higher, you start to get menstrual disturbances. Once you start to get even higher, you start to see things like clitoromegaly, or when it's much higher, you start to see muscle mass or balding. If you did an ultrasound, you would find multiple cysts on the, the ovary, the so-called string of pearls. And these cysts really aren't cysts. They really are early antral follicles that are all, as I like to think of in the on your market set position. They're all waiting there to get enough, enough FSH to grow. Uh, but they're not getting enough, so you get a buildup of these early antral follicles. And this diagnosis is normal gonadotropic, normal estrogenic, and ovulation, or what I like to think of as irregular signals. And the most common cause of this is PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is hyperandrogenic anovulation. And here you can see this is the uterus and this is the ovary, and just note how large that ovary is relative to the size of the uterus. This is a very hormonally active ovary. Here you can see an ultrasound with lots of little follicles. And if you see greater than 12 of these, at least in one ovary measuring between 2 and 10 millimeters, that goes along with ultrasound findings significant for PCOS. Here you also see uh, from a surgical specimen lots of follicles and lots of here yellow stroma that's hormonally active. The criteria for diagnosing polycystic ovarian syndrome are varied, but most people use the Rotterdam criteria. And this says that you need to have two of three things. You need to have either oligo or anovulation, as evidenced by irregular or no periods, excess androgens, which can be either clinical or biochemical, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. And this can either be by seeing multiple follicles or by seeing an ovary that's 10 cc's or greater. In addition, you have to rule out other causes, such as a tumor that's androgen producing or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, there's also androgen excess satiety criteria, and they're not all that different from the Rotterdam criteria, except that they say that one of the things that you have to have is excess androgens. Not surprising given that it's the androgen excess society. One other point I'll make is that if one is making a diagnosis of PCOS in an adolescent, the criteria are not so clear-cut. Um, often, we tend to like to use a patient having to have all three of these. They have to have a large ovary, not multiple follicles, and we like to see biochemical signs of excess androgens. The etiology is unknown, 
and it's a complex genetic trait, and there's probably many, many causes leading to the same common phenotype. Here you can see their FSH and LH are, are normal, but they have relatively more LH. The black is looking at a PCOS patient, and the hatch marks are looking at a normal ovulatory patient in the early follicular phase. They have normal levels of estradiol, but slightly elevated levels of estrone, and this is due to peripheral conversion in the fat of androstenedione into estrone. They have high levels, really, of any of the androgens that you want to check here. When we look at the androgens in women, testosterone, about 50%, is produced from peripheral conversion, half from the ovary, half from the adrenal. Androstenedione, again, about half and half from the adrenal and ovary. And DHEA is mostly made from the adrenal, and DHEAS is almost 100% made from the adrenal. So when we check a DHEAS level, we're really looking at adrenal production of, of androgens, whereas when we check, tes check testosterone or androstenedione, we're also looking at ovarian components. There are many hormonal factors in PCOS uh, that affect the hypothalamic pituitary axis. PCOS patients, some but not all, can have elevated LH, and again, this is not part of the diagnostic criteria, but they tend to have greater LH responsiveness, and this goes to the ovary and makes more ovarian androgens. This high androgen level goes to the liver and decreases SHBG, sex hormone blind binding globulin, that giant sponge that sops up free androgens. So if you decrease SHBG, you end up raising your free androgen levels. These androgens get converted to estrogens in the fat by aromatase. The more fat you have, the more conversion. And estrogen in these low levels, remember, inhibit FSH release. And you kind of get a relative increase of LH as it relates to FSH. Other hormonal factors, PCOS patients can be insulin resistant. And when one's ins resistant to insulin, one has elevated insulin levels. And if you think of insulin, insulin is the hormone that lets us use the energy and the sugar that we take in in the here and now. If there were a famine, it would be pretty smart for us to be resistant to insulin. So any energy we took in, we wouldn't be able to utilize, and instead we would put it in long-term storage. Now, long-term storage for energy is fat. So when someone is insulin resistant, they're not efficient at using their energy and their glucose in the here and now, and they tend to make a lot of fat. People that are insulin resistant have high insulin levels. This high insulin level leads to a high IGF-1 level. IGF-1 leads to increased LH, which increases total androgen production in the ovary. And this high IGF-1 level increases SHBG, which decreases free androgens. So they're getting an increase in total androgen, and an increase in free androgen. The more fat one has, the more insulin resistant one is. And the more insulin resistant one is, the higher the insulin is. And the higher the insulin is, the more fat you have. And it's really a vicious, vicious cycle. And if we can get people to reduce the amount of fat they have by losing weight, even small amounts of weight loss, such as 5%, can sometimes restore menstrual cyclicity in these PCOS patients. This is basically saying the same thing, that both PCOS and obesity can lead to insulin resistance, leading to high insulin levels, leading to high IGF-1, low SHBG, high LH, and overall higher androgen activity. This insulin resistance and central obesity, not only do they lead to these endocrine manifestations, but these endocrine manifestations, of course, we know can lead to the menstrual disturbance that we're talking about, hirsutism, and infertility. But it can also lead to metabolic manifestations such as glucose intolerance and diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, which long-term can lead to vascular disease. We know that this high insulin maintains normal glycemia in the patients, that insulin leads to LH, as I said, insulin leads to lower SHBG, and that if we give metformin, metformin can lower the insulin and actually lower androgens. I'm going to show you some dermatologic manifestations of insulin resistance. Here you can see acanthosis nigricans, and you can also see some skin tags. It's important to tell patients 
with PCOS that this is not dirt and they should try not try to wipe this off. And I've seen many, many patients with PCOS who have really caused significant irritation by trying to get rid of their acanthosis nigricans by scrubbing. And you need to let the patient know that they're not dirty. It is not dirt. So treatment here is really to allow the endometrium to cycle. We can give estrogen and progesterone or progestin, such as with an oral contraceptive pill, to allow that endometrium to cycle and shed and prevent hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. We can lower LH and FSH levels. Lowering the FSH levels might prevent some ovarian cysts. Lowering, uh, if we give, lower that FSH level, uh, rather, excuse me, lowering the LH level will ultimately decrease ovarian androgens. The estrogen in the birth control pill doesn't only lower FSH, but it's also going to increase SHBG to actually ultimately decrease free androgens. For fertility, we can think about ovulation induction in these patients. And unlike our patients that have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, they do have an intact hypothalamic pituitary access, so we can give them medications that rely on that, medications such as clomiphene citrate and letrozole. We could use FSH, and the role of insulin sensitizers such as metformin is for another topic. So the summary of the key points here is that patients with normal gonadotropic, normal estrogenic anovulation, such as PCOS patients, tend to have irregular or no ovulation. They have excess androgens. They can have high insulin. And these are the patients that are at risk for things such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. So in summary, menstrual cycle irregularities can occur from any time from puberty to the menopause. We can think of it as having hypothalamic problems, such as too few GnRH pulses, with stress or anorexia, too many or irregular GnRH pulses, such as with polycystic ovarian syndrome. There can be pituitary problems, such as a pituitary adenoma leading to excess leptin. There can be ovarian problems, such as ovarian insufficiency, and whether or not PCOS is a problem that also resides in the ovary is potential. There can be uterine problems, and we didn't discuss this, such as uterine scarring, that might occur from a procedure, a surgery, or that might occur from an infection, such as pelvic tuberculosis. Or there can be outflow tract problems, such as Eulerian anomalies, or urogenital sinus anomalies, such as with an imperforate hymen. And now I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollock. We've been uh, taking some questions, and I just want to remind everyone to, if you do have some questions, to type them into the uh, chat box. Uh, and I will now turn things over to Dr. LaBarbera. Thank you, Dr. Pollock, for a wonderful and very clear overview of menstrual disorders. We have several questions here that are related um, that deal with the last topic you were talking about, polycystic ovary syndrome. And one question that we have is, um, pertains to the percent of obese patients um, in whom weight loss causes a resolution of their PCF, PCOS. Is there, an, is there any sense of how effective weight loss and lifestyle modification actually is in obese or overweight PCOS patients? You know, the biggest issue is that weight loss is not easy to enact. Um, and lifestyle modifications are hard. You know, the best diets are those that use uh, daily dietary monitoring and extensive programs where patients check in frequently. We do know that weight loss, again, even modest amounts of weight loss, can restore menstrual cyclicity for some of our patients. But the problem often is, is that every patient is different. How much weight loss does one person need versus another? The flip side of that is that how much weight is too little weight? You know, some people can have a normal range BMI or BMI for age, but their weight is not enough for them to sustain their menstrual cycle. Whereas another patient with the exact same weight, it's just, it's perfectly fine. They can have normal menstrual cycles. So I think it's very variable depending on the patient. So is there a uh, certain percent of weight loss 
uh, that mu uh, or a certain percent of weight that must be lost in those patients in whom you know weight loss might be effective I mean is it for example one of these things where uh, you're not going to see a resolution of the PCOS unless you lose at least 10 percent of weight is there any sense of that we know that weight loss as little as 5% of their body weight in some patients can restore menstrual cyclicity. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that's powerful because if you tell someone they have to lose 50 pounds, it's an unattainable amount. I couldn't imagine losing 50 pounds. But sometimes losing 10 pounds can seem attainable for someone. And what I do in my clinical practice is I actually pull up the BMI calculator and I show them where they are now and I take them down five pounds, I take them down ten pounds and I show them how that can have a significant impact upon their BMI. And that seems to be very powerful for patients and very motivating. And I, I know that this is not uh, settled, it's not, the mechanisms are not known, but do you have any feelings or any theories about why it is uh, that weight loss actually does cause a resolution of PCOS in some patients, uh, uh, and you know what what uh, changes in hormonal profiles um, do you actually see in those PCOS patients who are obese and lose some weight? Right. In some of them, you can actually see a correction of some of their uh, gonadotropins. Uh, FSH and LH levels can tend to normalize, and even uh, androgen levels can tend to go down. The thing is, is that any study with PCOS is rather difficult because it's not one common disorder, it's a syndrome. And so if it were a single disease, it would be a lot easier to study. And the effects for lean PCOS is different than the effects for obese PCOS. Um, so I think it's a very difficult question to really fully answer. Okay, thank you. Now uh, to change topics, we have a question here dealing with uh, premature ovarian failure. Um, is there is there any evidence of uh, low telomerase activity being associated with premature ovarian failure, primary ovarian insufficiency? You know, I'm not sure, but I think it's higher telomerase activity. High. Okay. And I actually, if, if um, you want it, I actually have another case in my back pocket that I could talk about if you'd like me to. Please. We okay. still have some time. Awesome. So this is case four. Um, so this is a 16-year-old with no periods. She's 5'5", 110, with a BMI of about 21. She's got normal breasts, fully developed, 10 or 5 breasts, but very scant, almost no pubic hair. She has normal external genitalia, except for the fact that she has no pubic hair, but only a small vaginal dimple. Her FSH is normal, and her LH is normal, but a little bit on the higher side. And her estradiol is low. If you were to get imaging with an ultrasound or an MRI, you wouldn't see any uterus. And you would see gonads, but they would be at above the pelvic brim, and you wouldn't really see any follicles. So you decide to check more labs and you find a testosterone of 200 and a karyotype of 46XY. And so this is androgen insensitivity syndrome, which, which is a genetic defect associated with an abnormal androgen receptor. And the defect can be either complete or partial. Complete meaning that you don't recognize the androgen receptor at all, or partial meaning that you kind of recognize the androgen receptor a little bit, but not fully. And really, this is a defect of the outflow tract. It's really not an outflow tract obstruction as much as it is an absent outflow tract. And one of the important things is to differentiate androgen insensitivity syndrome from eulerian agenesis. Okay. Eulerian agenesis is that you don't form eulerian duct structures, uterus, tubes, upper vagina, for reasons that are not fully clear. But the patient with eulerian agenesis like the patient with androgen insensitivity, will have the so-called blind vaginal patch. They do have some vaginal tissue because they have the urogenital sinus component. They both will have breasts, 
but the patient with malarinogenesis will have normal pubic hair, and the patient with androgen insensitivity syndrome will not have pubic hair. The patient with androgen insensitivity will have elevated levels of LH and elevated for a female levels of testosterone, whereas the patient with malarinogenesis, both the LH and the testosterone will be completely normal. The patient with malarinogenesis will be 46XX versus the patient with androgen insensitivity will be 46XY. And one can always think, often having a uterus can be a biomarker, sometimes, for whether or not they ever were exposed to any um, testicular tissue. If you have a Y chromosome, that Y chromosome, if it's normal, will have normal SRY, and that SRY will lead to a cascade of events that leads to the formation of a testis. That testis, if it's normal, will have Sertoli and Leibig cells. If it has Sertoli cells, those Sertoli cells are going to make AMH, also called right, MIS or MIF. Um, we know AMH very well for ovarian reserve testing. But that AMH should inhibit the malarian ducts. That way boys don't have any normal female internal genitalia. If there's a normal testis, those testis will have Leydig cells, and those Leydig cells will make testosterone. In a typical male, that testosterone is going to maintain the Wolfian duct to form normal male internal genitalia, and that testosterone is going to be converted to dihydrotestosterone, which will virilize the urogenital sinus so that one has normal male external genitalia. But if one has androgen insensitivity syndrome, even though one has a completely normal SRY and a completely normal testis, and they're making Sertoli cells, which make them not have a uterus because of the AMH, and they have normal lytic cells that are making testosterone, they cannot recognize that testosterone. And because they can't recognize that testosterone, they do not maintain Wolfian duct structures, and they do not have male internal genitalia. They also do not virilize their external genitalia, and they have normal female external genitalia and a lower urogenital component of the vagina. But that's one important thing clinically is to differentiate between androgen and sensitivity. And again, right now I'm talking about complete, whereas in partial you'll have ambiguous genitalia versus eularian agenesis. But there are other outflow tract issues, such as Asherman's, which could be post-procedural or infectious. There can be an imperforate hymen, which is a defect of the urogenital sinus or transverse vaginal septum. And treatment here, if the patient has a Y chromosome, one needs to remove those gonads because of risk of germ cell cancers. Um, if one removes the gonads, one needs to provide hormones. One needs to give estrogen treatment to develop or maintain breast development and to maintain bone density. And one important thing to note is that giving hormone replacement to girls who are of an age when their body's expecting to see hormones is different than giving hormone replacement to postmenopausal women, and the same risks don't apply. Also important for anyone with any kind of outflow tract obstruction, we want to think about sexual function. If they don't have a vagina, do we need to create one? Most commonly done with vaginal dilation, but sometimes with surgery, such as the various neovagina procedures, like a Macindo or a Vecchietti. If they have an imperfect hymen, we're going to do a hymenectomy. If they have a transverse vaginal septum, we're going to remove that vaginal septum, sometimes requiring pull-downs or grafts if they also have vaginal atresia. And if they have Asherman syndrome, we're going to do a hysteroscopic resection of the synechiae. And for fertility, it really depends what the cause is. Sometimes the surgery is the treatment for the fertility, but sometimes these patients do need to think about gestational surrogacy or adoption. And, and now I think that's the end of my slides. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollack. Uh, we do not have any more questions, so we're going to go ahead and, and uh, uh, move into uh, our, our, our post-discussion here. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our webinar this evening with Dr. Stacy Pollack. Uh, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and to complete the survey. Our next live event will be on Wednesday, March the 16th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern with Dr. Ann J. Davis, who will present on the topic of puberty. Registration is currently open for that event. Uh, you can find that registration on ASRM eLearn.
Uh, thank you again to our speaker. Thank you to all in attendance. This webinar is now ended.